So, uh, so hi everyone, uh, I'm Mark Jackson. Um, I'm not only the host of the Portland Quantum Computing Meetup Group, I'll be giving the presentation today. So let me start sharing my slides here. And what I'll be talking about is called Ticket, and, uh, and this is a quantum development platform that was developed by Cambridge Quantum Computing, the company I work for. And, uh, and even though we've been developing it for several years, there have been some important developments just the past few months in particular. And so, uh, so I'm very eager to be telling you about some of these things today. So first, I'd like to begin by telling you a little bit about Cambridge Quantum Computing, uh, the company. We were established in 2014, which makes us one of the oldest quantum computing companies. We now have over 140 people, which makes us one of the largest companies. We focus on quantum software. So we don't build the computers themselves. For that, we have partnerships with every major quantum hardware provider like IBM, Honeywell, Google, Microsoft, etc. And we are especially close with IBM and Honeywell. Uh, they're actually investors in ours. And this allows us to resell time on some of their machines. We have expertise in every, every area of, of quantum software. Um, I'll be focusing today on the ticket compiler, but we also have expertise on chemistry, machine learning, and cybersecurity. So I wanted to quickly summarize quantum computing. I know many of you are very familiar with this, but just to, to give you a very quick overview of this. So normal computers work with bits which are, of course, ones and zeros, whereas quantum computers work with qubits, or quantum bits. And a qubit is in what's called a superposition. It's like a zero and a one at the same time. And you can think of this a bit like with a coin. A normal coin uh, with a classical computer is like a coin on, the, uh, on a table, whereas a quantum bit, a qubit, is like a coin spinning around. Um, it's it's in between the zero and one, the heads and tails. And when you combine that with entanglement, you unlock a vast number of states. Uh, there's a large number of configurations that a quantum computer can consider simultaneously. And that's really the power of quantum computing is that for problems that can take advantage of this, there's a large number of configurations that you can consider simultaneously. Now, the classic problem to, to do using quantum computing is in chemistry. This was one of the first uh, applications of quantum computing. And a good example is in caffeine. So this is, it's not a particularly large molecule, it has only 24 atoms. But if you were to use a normal computer to try to solve this, you would have to use a normal computer about this almost a tenth the size of the earth. And if you made the molecule bigger, say, by studying penicillin, you would have to use a computer the size of the whole observable universe. And so clearly, those are impossible to do. And quantum computers, on the other hand, would be able to solve these type of problems using only a modest number of qubits. And so this is why people are so excited about quantum computing. We could use it to solve problems that we never could have hoped to have solved previously. These quantum computers really do exist, of course. Uh, there's many different approaches. And some of these approaches are, are shown here. Um, approaches like superconducting and ion trap and photonic um, are, are becoming popular. And there's many different groups using different approaches here. It's important to recognize that it's not just the number of qubits, it's also the quality of the qubits that's important. And that's why, um, in particular, IBM has been popularizing something called the quantum volume. And this is one metric which in incorporates a lot of parameters like the number of qubits and the, the error rate, the quality of the qubits, into one single parameter. And so, uh, so if you make a graph of that, you see that the recent progress in the quantum volume is really extraordinary. It's actually quite a bit faster than even Moore's law um, because we see the doubling in the quantum volume at least every 12 months, if not sooner. Um, and that's shown just by that blue line by IBM. The orange line is the progress made by Honeywell. And you see that they're on a much faster trajectory. And then that yellow dot up there is, uh, is the claimed qu new quantum processor by IonQ. And they claim they will have a quantum processor soon with a quantum volume of 4 million which is of course extraordinary if it's true. I only put an asterisk there because it hasn't been verified by outside groups, but they're a, they're a super team, so I have no reason to doubt this. So there's been a lot of progress in, uh, in quantum computing hardware the past few years, and we expect that it will continue for the next several years. 
Right now, however, quantum computers aren't uh, as powerful as we would like them to be. In fact, we're in this, what, this era that we call NISC, a noisy intermediate scale quantum. And that means that we have about 100-ish qubits. They still have a relatively high error rate. And there's no such thing as error correction. Um, so error correction is, of course, when you, you take the information in one qubit and you smear it over several. And this way, it prevents one qubit from spoiling your whole, um, your, your whole quantum circuit. Um, the other qubits can recover the information. But to even get error correction to work, of course, you need to have a, a pretty small error rate to begin with, and we're not quite there yet. There's also constraints on the connectivity, because oftentimes qubits are connected in a way that, that a qubit is only talking to a few other qubits. And so that's why there's been a lot of emphasis recently on what's called hybrid algorithms, where some commands are sent to the quantum processor and some commands are sent to the classical processor. And in fact, most of the heavy lifting is still done by the classical processor. And so getting them to work together in a clever way, um, which solves your problem, is, uh, is the heart of hybrid algorithms. And I'm um, really belaboring this point of the NISC era for, for a reason that will become clear in a few minutes. I think many of you are familiar with the concept of a compiler. And that's because as humans, as, uh, as human programmers, we have to write in programs that we understand. And that could be Python or C or something like that. But of course, the machine doesn't understand that. The machine only understands binary. And so there has to be something translating what we as, uh, as human programmers type in and turning that into binary instructions for the machine. And that something is the compiler. And so compilers have been around for decades and a good compiler not only does that translation, it makes it efficient because you want your program to use as little memory as possible and to run as quickly as possible. It is exactly the same thing with a quantum computer. You still need a compiler um, to turn the instructions that you as a, as a human programmer write into instructions for the quantum computer. And so that means that the algorithms that you might develop for chemistry or machine learning or what have you need to be turned into instructions for the quantum computer. And right now, the problem is especially acute because there are several different types of quantum hardware, each, each being developed by different groups, and they even have different languages. So to explain what that is, several different major groups like IBM and, and uh, Google and Microsoft have developed their own quantum languages like Qiskit or, or Circ or Q Sharp. And if you use one of those languages to write your program in, you're pretty much locked in to using that language for, um, for, the, for the, the hardware. And what Ticket does is Ticket translates the language that you've chosen and it allows you to execute it on the machine that you've chosen. So for example, you could write your program in Qiskit and you could still execute it on the Google machine. And so, uh, so th this is a really important development in quantum computing that there's this ag hardware agnostic universal compiler and Ticket doesn't just do the compilation, it finds the most efficient way to run your program on the hardware platform that you've chosen. To, uh, to point out just how different this is from, from some of the other compilers available right now, this is a chart showing Ticket compared to some of the other compilers. And you see that Ticket is by far the most universal approach being used. So again, if you, uh, if you use the other compilers and the other languages, you're pretty much locked into using one type of hardware whereas Ticket allows you to be completely hardware agnostic. Um, it supports almost every major uh, quantum hardware platform and we're constantly updating it. So, uh, so if a new hardware platform comes out, it's always incorporated into the newest version of Ticket. So how does Ticket do this? How does it find the most efficient way to execute the quantum program that you've run on the, on the hardware that you've chosen? So it does this in, uh, in two different components. So the first component is what's called circuit optimization. And this has nothing to do with the hardware. This is completely based in the circuit that you've designed. And then the second half is specific to the hardware that you've chosen. This is really solving the constraints that come in um, from the hardware that you've chosen. And so I'd like to say a few more words about each of those um, in, in turn. So the first part is the circuit optimization. And this is really just reducing the gate count. Um, it uses something called people optimization, which means that ticket goes through your circuit 
and it looks for ways it could simplify. It could reduce the number of gates. The way that does this is it looks for patterns which allow it to reduce the gate count. And I'll give a few examples very shortly. And so, uh, so the first thing it does is, is people optimization. And then afterwards, it does more sophisticated optimization, um, which is more macroscopic. It looks for patterns that have repeated in the course of your quantum circuit. So let me now show you a few examples of this. So the first example up there on the upper left-hand side, you see two CNOT gates in a row. And of course, you know that two CNOT operations will actually just cancel each other out. That's, this is identical to just the unity operator. And so, so Ticket is aware of this and it will remove those two and it replaces it with just the unity operator. Um, these other examples here are a little less obvious to us, um, but mathematically you can check that they're true. And so Ticket has all these examples plus several more already built into it. And so it goes through your circuit and it looks for all these patterns and it, it simplifies it. So it tries to reduce the gate count. Um, I've listed an article here in case you, you're curious about the mathematical structure behind this. So that's the first step. The second step is solving the constraints based on the hardware that you've chosen. Now there's, there's a few different types of constraints that this could be. So the first type of constraint could just be how the qubits are connected. So this is the architecture of the quantum processor. But the second constraint is what gates are native to that hardware. And I'll give you a few examples here. So these are three examples of quantum processors and they're all superconducting. So they have something in common, but you see that the way that the qubits are connected is very different. Um, so between Google, IBM and Rigetti, you see that the qubit connectivity is vastly different. And then furthermore, at the bottom of the screen, I've listed the basis gates. So these are the gates that the, the quantum computer is aware of at a native level. These are not necessarily the gates that you as the programmer would be using. And so Ticket will take all of this into account. You don't need to worry about any of these details. Ticket knows what the architecture and the native gates are. And so it will translate your circuit into, uh, into all of this for you. So let me give you a very simple example here. Uh, at the top of the screen here is the IBM Melbourne quantum circuit. And so this is 14 qubits. And you see that there's varying numbers of, of qubit connectivity here. The most number of qubits connected is four. So some of the qubits have these, these four qubit couplings. And at the bottom of the screen, I have a, a simple quantum circuit here. And you see right away that there's actually a five qubit coupling. So those two qubits at the bottom there, they talk to each other, but they also talk to three other qubits at the top there. And so naively, you might think, well, I can't run this circuit on this IBM Melbourne quantum circuit. Uh, it just requires too much coupling between the qubits. But that's not true. You actually can run it. It just takes a little bit of cleverness with what's called the routing. And so the, the routing is when you move the qubits around um, so that they are closer to each other. And this can happen mid-circuit. So you can move the qubits around. Um, the cost of this is, of course, you have operations to do this. So this is like Hadamards and CNOTs and everything. And this is very expensive. You, every time you're adding gates, you're increasing the chance that something might go wrong and it makes the circuit last a little bit longer. So you don't want to route things unless you absolutely have to. Ticket does all of this for you. Again, it, it knows the architecture of the system. And so it will take care of all of the routing for you. And it finds a, a nearly optimal solution to routing your circuit. We not only use Ticket internally at CQC when we design our algorithms, um, but many other groups have been using it. So CERN and IBM and Google and so forth have all written academic papers in which they have been building algorithms using Ticket. And I've listed just a few of these articles here. Um, and they, they have positive things to say about it. And there's also been this benchmarking study by Arlene. And so, uh, so the two types of benchmarking that Arlene did was on the left-hand side, they benchmarked the number of gates that resulted when, when they took some circuits and they ran at different compilers. And you see that ticket resulted in quite a bit fewer gates needed to run the circuit compared to the others. On the right-hand side there is the execution time of ticket compared to Qiskit and circ. And you see that this vertical axis is on a logarithmic scale. So that means that ticket actually ran orders of magnitude faster than the other compilers. And a few minutes ago, I was really belaboring this whole idea of NISC. 
And the reason I was doing that is because right now, quantum computers don't have that many qubits and the error rate is still relatively high. And so running a short circuit may be the difference between the program running or not running because it's, it's very easy for a, uh, an error to creep in right now. And so it's absolutely essential that programs run quickly and with as few operations as possible. And so, uh, so the Arlene benchmarks here show that that ticket really does compare favorably to the other types of compilers. We are constantly updating it. Um, and, uh, and there's a very important update that we had about three months ago. And that was that we removed all licensing restrictions from ticket. So it used to be that, that we had certain licensing restrictions and there were fees associated with that. But about three months ago, we removed all of that. And so Ticket is available for free uh, right now. Anyone can download and use it, and, uh, and I would encourage you to do so. We are also constantly updating it um, with the latest hardware. And so if, if you read about some group coming out with a new version of, of a quantum hardware platform, it will be incorporated in the newest version of Ticket. And we even have advanced features like mid-circuit measurement and things like that. Um, we are, we're constantly updating it again. We have some big plans for the future. Uh, so the, the next thing coming out will be something that we call Kermit, which is an error mitigation toolkit. It's not quite error correction, but it's the next best thing. It allows the errors to be reduced. And uh, we've developed a toolkit just for that, and that will be coming out soon, and it's open source. The second thing is that we will be moving things to the cloud. Right now, you need to download Ticket from GitHub and install it locally to do the compilation. But very soon, we'll be having a cloud-based version of that. And of course, this automatically has the latest version of Ticket, but it also makes it much easier to, to collaborate with other users. Um, and it should also have better integration with cloud um, classical computing platforms like, like uh, Microsoft Azure and AWS. Finally, we are starting to think beyond NISC. Um, so we actually are starting to develop an error correcting team, which will incorporate some of that technology into Ticket. And so, uh, so Ticket really will be the quantum compiler for the future as quantum computers develop more capabilities. So this is the GitHub repo, which is available. Um, you use download it as you would normally. Um, the repo has all of these, uh, all the documentation and instructions and examples. Uh, there's lots of Jupyter notebooks with different features um, that you can try for examples here. And you install it just using the normal pip install. Um, there's the generic uh, PyTicket, that's the Python implementation of this. And you also just need to install the module that you expect to use, whether it's it's IBM's Qiskit or Circ or, or what have you. So, uh, so you just in install the ones that you expect to use, and then you're ready to go. I finally want to mention that, uh, as I mentioned in the very beginning, um, we have a very close relationship with IBM and Honeywell. And so uh, this allows us to resell time on some of their hardware. And so for those of you who are developing uh, for enterprise, if you would be interested in shorter term access to some of these premium quantum hardware devices. I'd be glad to speak with you about that. Um, the terms are much more favorable than if you went to the teams directly. And so, uh, so this, this has been a popular feature among some developers. So that was it. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update about Ticket and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Hi, is uh, Joe Helmers. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, I'm curious. I talked about the routing and you know having the that kit that uh, Pi Pi Ticket has information about uh, the hardware platforms. Um, when, so for example, IBM came out with a new uh, backend. Uh, last week or the week before, and does that when that type of thing happens? Get a version of a uh, Pi ticket to to act, to have that compiled correctly against that sort of platform. That's right. Um, I, I didn't get every word. It broke up a little bit. But I think you're asking, does uh, does Ticket have all the latest features of of the newest hardware, um, such as IBM's? And the answer is yes. Um, it might take us a few weeks to implement some of the updates, but uh, but the newest version of Ticket does always have the most recent quantum hardware. But but uh, but you do have to upgrade, right? You have to upgrade your. That, that's right. Yeah. You, right now you have to upgrade because you're you're downloading it off GitHub and installing it locally. Um, when we unveil the cloud-based version, it will be automatically included. But uh, but for now, you just have to upgrade. Yes. Okay. Thanks. 
Um, this is Sunil. I put my question into the uh, chat window. Yes, thank you. So, so I'll read it for everyone. So would Ticket be more of a transpiler than a compiler, something akin to how uh, Antor works? Um, so I'm not that familiar with transpilers. Maybe you could explain in a few more words what you mean by that? Yeah, so a transpiler would, um, for, for example, let's say you have a domain specific language, which um, a circuit is actually a good example of. Um, a transpiler takes a domain specific language and translates into, into some other language. Um, be it like, you know, you can go to low level languages, you can go to SQL, you can go to whatever the language is. Um, so in this particular case, there's chasm that you can target that or some of the other uh, languages that deal with quantum machines. Um, and that's why I was asking is like, is it more of a transpiler than an actual compiler? So you got like, you start with a grammar for the front end and then on the back end, you target the various different architectures. Yes, so it, so it does have that feature in common with transpilers and that it can convert between the languages, um, but it is still a compiler in that it does, the end result is, uh, is the instructions for the machine, like a compiler. So um, the next question, the modules you mentioned for every language, what do they do actually? Because you said that one program can be run on different quantum computers. Yes, so the modules um, are specific for that language. It's just that adding each of these different um, each of these different architectures, it takes up memory, and uh, and so you don't want to install them unless you have to. And so, for the ones that you expect that you might be using, you can install those, um, and th and then it can convert between the two. That's all. Are there any further questions? Uh, Mark Steve Blyler from Portland State. Um, Hi. Hi, Steve. I'm immediately going to hand this off to all my students and say you really should check this out. A lot of them have a lot of trouble designing quantum circuits. So yeah, if Ticket will do it for them, I can expect much better results when I ask them to do stuff like that. Um, is there a, since it's essentially uh, free now, I guess that was going to be my question. Uh, you don't, we don't worry about an educational version or an educational packet. That's exactly right. Send yeah. Them and say, Go to GitHub and get this. That, that's exactly right. Yeah. We used to have all these distinctions, um, but three months ago, we, we did away with all that. Um, the only thing that we ask now is that you give us feedback on how we can make it better. And if you write an article using ticket that you just credit ticket and say that you used it, that's all, but, uh, but it's completely free and you can use it however you wish. Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, what kind of interface do you have to have? Q sharp, Q sharp isn't Python. No, um, you can you can use Python. You can also use Q sharp or circ or Quizkit. Um, however you however you would like to do that. It understands them all. Has Ticket been used for MBQC? Um, what is MBQC? Measurement-based quantum computing. Um, no, I don't, not that I know of. Um, so I know this is more popular with photonic and, and such. Um, I'm not aware of that, but I'll let you know if it, if it has been. So good. So thank you. Um, uh, again, if you have any questions or, uh, or comments on that, please let me know. And thank you again.